Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media, I'm Grant Abbott and today I'm going to be talking about the workflow behind making low poly assets like this and a bit about the artistic pipeline for making game assets from concept art to sending the model to the developers. In later episodes I'll actually be breaking down and modelling one of these game assets and in other episodes I'll be painting the assets but in this one I'm just going to give an overview about my thought processes when I get a piece of concept art and how I turn that into low poly objects and thinking about the painting workflow so it can be optimized for games. So here's the concept art that I was sent. So this is from the sort of lead artist, should we call him, Chris Handloser. And he's done some lovely work with the concept pieces. Here's the log storage, the stone storage. And here's the one I'm working on at the moment, which is the gold storage. And now there's some limitations and you always get this when you've got a game company that you're working for and that will be things like polygon count and texture sizes. The biggest limitation is the texture map size. All this needs to be on one 512 by 512 pixel texture map. And we're not using any normal maps or glossy maps or anything like that. It's purely just a diffuse or albedo as you might call it. So a simple color texture map. So here's the model so far and you can kind of see how I've interpreted the theme. I've tried to, where possible, keep as close to the original artwork as I can. Let's take a closer look at this section here and I'll talk you through and break down how I've done this. So if I take this wooden stake here that's sticking out of the ground and I go into edit mode, first of all you'll notice that all of them are selected. That means they're linked objects, so if I change one thing here it changes it on all of them. And that's a really important part of this particular job's workflow. To get that texture map size down, all these objects will be sharing that one texture map. It has its challenges, but it will mean it's possible to get all this texture onto one small texture map. Because not only do they share all the sort of transform details and polygons, but they also share the same texture map. I can actually go into look dev mode now and you can see the textures. They look a tiny bit rough close up, but hopefully you can get the idea. You can sort of see the pixels as well because we're that close in and you can see them on the lock there. You can just about see the pixels and this is probably as close as we'll get. It's more likely to be viewed from about this sort of distance where it's absolutely fine. You can also see it's fine that these share the same texture map. I could increase the variation by perhaps rotating this one round and then it has a bit more variation. So now they look slightly different from each other but it's not essential in this case. What I want to show you is with this door how I go about planning and making the low poly assets. So if we zoom in on this door you can see that it's got tiny notches in it. But if I go into the actual topology itself you can see that I've hand drawn the gap between the planks in this case and then created some holes where I felt it's needed. Having said that with this particular one I am changing my mind on it because I think it's too high poly for what's needed. If we're viewing it from about here and if I go back into object mode you can see that there's not a lot of difference to be seen there if I click off there. Perhaps this notch helps slightly to add some character but is it really necessary you've got to ask yourself. I think this one here certainly not needed. It's only when I get round to here that I can see through it. This notch here is behind the lock so that's not necessary either. I could possibly have a couple of these if I've got the polygons to play with. So what I've done to show you examples of this this particular shape, if I go into edit mode and select all, I can see that that's 104 tries. Now I work in tries, so I've just triangulated it. I have actually modeled it in quads and then converted it to triangles. All render engines, game engines and everything like that use tries. So any quads you have are just converted to tries when rendered. So when we're talking about polygons, we're always talking about triangles. Actually quite a lot of developers talk more about vertices than they do faces. So that's worth bearing in mind as well. But if we go across to this one, so this is actually three separate planks. And interestingly, that's 84 tries, whereas this one is 104 tries. So this one is actually higher poly than the three separate planks. So why would I want to combine them together like that? Well, in this case, it's actually texture space. There's a lot of space wasted in between each plank. And if I go in and try to paint that, it's a little bit awkward. I have to hide this area paint there, hide this area, paint there. It's not too bad, but it's just the time it takes, but also the texture space. So there's really no need for that. Better still though, is this one here. So this is really limited. I haven't converted this to triangles yet, but Blender tells us it's 38. 
So this is half the triangles of this one, and I can paint in the difference between the planks with just a sort of deeper, darker line. So I can use my texturing to give the illusion of that gap in the middle. And especially when we see it from around this distance, that will be absolutely fine. So we've managed to halve our poly count just by thinking about those things. And you'll see, in fact, if I turn off my ambient occlusion at the moment, that that looks almost flat anyway. So the difference between the two is minimal, but there is a big difference in poly count. So I'll go back to solid mode for a moment. Other things that are worth thinking about when you're designing your concept art is circles and cylinders. So if we take this one here, for example, now the frustrating thing with cylinders and circles, which obviously appear a lot of the time, is that it's quite unavoidable to have a reasonably high poly count on them because you're trying to make that curve seem more like a curve. So here you can really see the edges in that lock. It's not too bad from this distance though. So you're always having to make up your mind how many polygons to put around your cylinders. For some of the smaller cylinders, you need slightly less because it needs less to make up that sort of curve shape. But for the bigger ones, you'll need more. So actually, think about in your concept art whether you need the cylinders. In this case, I think they look great, so I can understand why they're put in. And you don't want everything to be really blocky and square. So you will have to use them a lot of the time. But for that reason, there may be some instances where I want to change from cylinders to sort of cube shape just for ease. So in this door, for example, if I zoom in on that, I have kept the shape from the concept art in this case. But you could argue, could we have this as a square and therefore have less polygons for it? Having said that, I don't think it's too many polygons in this particular situation. Now, just sort of reiterating about that modular approach, if I go into edit mode, you can see that this door is shared three times and this beam here is shared even more times. That's how we're managing to get all this information onto one texture space because all these objects share one texture area that's this big. Now you may notice, if I zoom in on one of my stones, that I have beveled the edges. It's tricky to know when to bevel and when not to, but you always have to think about the distance you're viewing your object from. So if I'm about this sort of distance, I can still see the bevel, so it is possibly worth it. Whereas on this object, this side supporting beam here, I think it would be hard to see a bevel, therefore it's kind of pointless to have one, and I've just used a cube. Now if we look at the steps for another example, and I go into edit mode with those, and come round to the bottom here, you can see that originally this vertices, when I modeled it, if I grab in the y-axis, was all the way back over here. And it's probably worth saying that it's fine to have these overlapping faces. That's not a problem. I get asked that all the time. No, it's not an issue to have overlapping faces like this. And it can reduce polygons, in fact. But overlapping this much is pointless. So I've brought this forward to as close as I can so that I'm not wasting too much texture space, which is all important. Now an argument could be made for whether I need these inside faces of this block here. And now let's have a closer look at that block. I'll go into edit mode here. So we can't see that face in there, but we can in here, which is a bit of a pain. So at the moment I kind of need it, but can I change my stairs so it overlaps this slightly and therefore get rid of this face in here, which is actually an end gone. So if I triangulate this by selecting all and press control T, you can see that there's a fair few faces in there that I might be able to get rid of or minimize. And therefore I can use this nice big area of texture space rather than have it wasted. So that's something I'll be tidying up shortly. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can go about making your models. Like I've said, I will go into more detailed tutorials about specific models and how I made them and do a sort of detailed rundown so you can see me actually make the model. But I thought I'd show you the actual workflow in this case. The next stage for me now, after a bit of optimization, is to organize my files and name them. <laughs> As you can see there, I've got lots of collections and things. That's really important when I'm unwrapping objects, especially when you've got lots of linked duplicates like this. Then I'll actually unwrap by marking all the seams, and then I'll be on to texture painting. Once I do that, then I'll send the models off as OBJs, but all separate OBJs that they can bring into Unity and test out and make sure it's all working. People have been asking me about lighting. Well, no, there's not much lighting going on. The lighting will be absolutely minimal because it's a mobile game. So I have to do some tricks with the texturing and there'll have to be some tricks as well, the other end in Unity and so forth. And I'll leave those for further episodes. Do remember to comment below with any thoughts or questions you have. 
and that will inform my later series. I hope this is all helpful to you, and I'll see you next time.